Amendment number 62, July 5th, 2017. Hope you're all well this evening. Thank you all for coming. So for this evening, thank you to our sponsors. So we've been running this for a couple of years. We've got a list of sponsors here. We have Westcon and Cloud Health, who are at the top there tonight. So they're, they're helping us putting on this, this event. Um, so big shout out to those guys. Tonight we have a lightning talk with David and Adam for our team. We've already been, um, for some reason, a lightning talk. I think he missed, he missed the boat and created 16 slides, so I'm going to have to go dum 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 for 16, 16 times. Uh, so that's our first. Then we have Nick from Cloud Health who's going to give us a talk who's over here. And then we have break. We do some networking, some pizzas, have some beers, chat to everyone, see what's going on. And then we have Reese from Westcon, who's up after that. So, thanks to our sponsors. Give them a quick. Hey, hey. thank you. Everyone. So next up, we have Adam and David. So I'll give it to you guys to take away. Okay. Want another microphone? Yes. One slide. My 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 lovely assistant here. Yes. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, first of all, I'm going to give a, a very, very uh, quick rundown of some of the new things that have come out uh, in Amazon Web Services. Uh, and then I'll give uh, an introductory talk on uh, application load balances. So, starting with uh, what's new, um, uh, auto-scaling in uh, DynamoDB. Uh, what you can do now is that um, the read and write capacity will now auto scale automatically. Uh, you go in, you can set a, a minimum, a maximum, and then a desired percentage because because of the spiking, uh, you want to make sure you've got some capacity when it spikes. Um, step functions, I spoke about this about two months ago, and uh, someone mentioned that it wasn't available in this region. Uh, it is now available in this region. And just a quick reminder, step functions are a visual workflow on microservices. So I'll give you a centralized logging, et cetera, for all your Lambda functions and uh, you know, you put condition statements and et cetera, et cetera. Um, Aurora, you can now export directly to S3 from Aurora. So if you've got a database in Aurora and you're doing a uh, MySQL dump, you don't have to put it onto some hard disk somewhere and then copy it up to Aurora, you know, directly to Aurora. And uh, Amazon WAF. Now, uh, you, you might know that Amazon WAF um, is in the cloud front, but in this region, um, we don't have it in this region yet, you can put WAF into application load balances, but it's not here yet. Now, what this is, this is a rate-based rules. So, um, I meant the first um, instance I ever created in the cloud, which wasn't at Amazon, I had brought two two open to the world, and I knew that because lots of different people were coming in. And of course, what happens is that your secure log gets flooded with all these people trying to log in as root. Um, so I looked for ways to try, and rather than whitelist the port two two, I looked for ways to try and get faster. And one of the one of the things I used was a thing called fail to ban. And what that does is it examines your logs, and over a set period of time, if there's, a, if there's a failed request coming in on one port, it then bans that port, and it puts an entry into your IP tables. Well, this is basically what this does. So, but it can, do, it can do it for other things as well as logins. So you can uh, mitigate DDoS attacks, uh, brute force logins. So what it will do is go through, and if there's a certain amount coming in in a stated length of time, it will put it into the WAF ACL and then uh, ban it. So that's a pretty handy feature. There's a couple of uh, also RANs that I didn't put up here. Um, there's things like, uh, I don't know how many here will be using um, workspaces. Um, that comes in, now comes out in uh, Windows 10 and you can encrypt the uh, volumes of workspaces. And also RDS, uh, particularly for test uh, development environments, you can now stop and start RDS instances. You couldn't do that before. Take a snapshot and then uh, build them again. So th there are some limitations on this. Um, you can't do this. if it's a multi AZ or re replica. You can't do this. So it's really designed for development and test RDSs. You can turn them off after seven days. They will automatically restart again. So it's a, a money saving feature. 
Um, so that's basically uh, a rundown on what's new. There's, you can go and have a look. There's loads and loads of, of things coming out all the time on Amazon. Uh, so I'm just trying to find the, the interesting things. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to give a, a quick a quick introduction to application load balancers. Now it's going to be um, won't be at any great depth, but uh, for those of you who are interested in you know figuring out the difference between an application load balancer and the classic load balancer, we'll go into that in a little detail. This is what you'll get when you go to uh, the console to create a load balancer. This is what is preferred with Amazon now: is the application load balancer. They're not going to be duplicating features in the classic and in the um, application. This is the one they really want you to use. And uh, for most cases, it's the better choice. And you'll see um, here that this can go off into different groups, whereas this is in, all in the same group. So next slide, please. Thank you. OK. So here, here's a sort of um, outline of the uh, application load balancer. Uh, and you've got these different, different sections. Um, this is your core load balancer. You've got your listeners here, and you've got your target groups here. So this part, your core of the load balance, will take care of the basic networking. So this will, you can determine whether this is internet facing or it's private. Uh, the subnets, the availability zones, and your security groups all go in this bit here. Now these listeners are. <laughs> These listeners will, will listen on, on port 80 or port 443. And uh, you can set up lots and lots of these different listeners. So you can have lots of different URLs coming in to the same load balancer. And you can't do that with the um, classic load balancers. And as we go down here, we have target groups. So each one of these target groups has a target. Now that can be an EC2 instance. Or of course, this target group, the arm from this, can be put into an application uh, to, to auto scaling group. So that becomes very handy. Now, you'll see here we have rules. You have multiple rules on the listener. And the rules, rules here, the application load balancer will filter on the content on the header. So you've got the host path and you've got the path, or I think it's called the request URI. So you can then write the rules to filter these uh, the incoming packets here and, and determine which one of these target groups that they go to. And you can have, uh, I think, up to 10 rules for each one, uh, but you can probably get more. Um, and the, the target groups here will be, um, as I said, you can have either EC2 instances or you could put in there uh, auto scaling groups. And these have got a health check on them. And if you're using auto scaling groups, also you can, these can be used to do auto scaling. So if the health check fails, you can uh, notify your auto scaling group and it will kill off that instant with a new one for you. Uh, pricing on these is also pretty good. Uh, app, uh, basic application load balance will be about $20 a month US. Um, these are about $22 a month. Um, then you get this sort of thing they call um, load, uh, I think it's a load balance, so cost units. So they have this algorithm to work out extra charges like uh, how many new connections you're getting, uh, how many existing connections you've got, the bandwidth coming through, uh, and the number of rules you have. So this, if you really, really go to town, you could knock this up to say 40 or $50 a month. But remember, you can have up to 10 listeners, and that can replace up to 10 classic load balances. So you really can save a lot of money with this. So I'll hand you over to uh, our next speaker, Adam. Adam will be talking a little bit about DynamoDB, um, about exporting and importing data. Thank you. Introduction to DynamoDB, for those that don't know. Um, it's a managed service replicated across multiple availability zones. Effectively, it's a key value store. Um, it's a NoSQL database. And as David suggests, it's, uh, auto scaling is now available. The pricing is based on provision throughput, uh, data transfer out, and storage used. 
first 25 gig per month is free, so that's part of the free tier as well. You can provision DynamoDB tables and use up to 25 gig. Who here is using DynamoDB? Show hands. Any small view? Yes. And yeah, data, data transfer in is free at the services. Some additional features you can use with DynamoDB. Um, so you can use DynamoDB streams. So effectively, this is a log tracking of all item level changes and applications, your applications can consume those logs and perform functions based on that information. Uh, DynamoDB triggers, so it can trigger AWS Lambda functions based on those changes and under the covers that does use DynamoDB streams. Cross-region replication, so this is effectively just an open source library that AWS provides, runs on an EC2 instance and can enable cross-region replication. And DynamoDB Accelerator, it's quite new in the last few weeks I think. Uh, it's a managed service and it's actually a new endpoint for DynamoDB that enables caching. So you just update your application to use this new endpoint, writes will go to the back end table and reads will read from the cache if it's populated. But more so about export and import. Um, so DynamoDB can use this tool for exporting or even for backing up on a scheduled basis. Um, if you want to just jump to the next slide. So you Jump into the DynamoDB console. This is the console here. Just hidden out the uh, table name there. So you select your table name, come up into actions and select export. So this is only within supported regions. But if your region is not supported, there is a little bit of a trick around getting that export still to work. So once you select export, it actually opens up into an AWS data pipeline console. So it's a new tab. So it gives you a predefined set of parameters put in your name, description, it uses a template which is predefined for you as well, there's a few other templates in there for other services. A source table name, an output S3 location, and this read throughput ratio is interesting as well, so it's, it's a ratio of how much read throughput has been provisioned for your table. So if you wanted to speed up this export process, you can provision or up, up your throughput in your DynamoDB table, and the, the percentage of that new read through throughput value for your speaker. So you can scale up to speed up the export process and scale back down once that's finished. And you do need to select the, do you want to just jump out a step? Um, so this is the region of the source table. So when I was saying unsupported regions, you can just put in the region there of your DynamoDB table and it will still export out from that region. Why would I do this? Why would you export DynamoDB? So you can back that up to retain that data. Sometimes the data can be sensitive and needs to be consistent or you might want to export and migrate from region to region, potentially. So within that same screen, if you just scroll down, so you come to a schedule as well, so you, like I said with the backup, you can schedule on a daily basis, or if you just wanted a one-off execution, you can just select on pipeline ex <coughs> activation, and you can add some logging features as well if you wanted to know how that pipeline export is going. This is again on the same screen, so it needs some permission to be able to read from that table, so it uses an IAM role. You can just leave it as default and it will automatically create that IAM role for you to access the DynamoDB table and like all services, you can add tags as well. And then down the bottom is, is activate as well, so once you finish filling out this, this uh, page, you can hit activate and it will initiate that DynamoDB export. So these are the components involved. So as part of the export process, uh, data pipeline starts up an elastic MapReduce cluster. So there's a few components involved in this, but the data pipeline makes this all seamless in the background for you. So data pipeline starts the elastic MapReduce, which will read the DynamoDB table items, and then we'll push that data to the S3 bucket of where you defined. And like I said before, you can scale up the read or write throughput, depending on the export import process, to speed up that export process. And then the import is effectively the inverse of that. So the data pipeline again uses the Elastic MapReduce cluster, retrieves the, the data from the S3 bucket which you've exported, is a particular format as well. Uh, it breaks that down into particular objects, um, the, how big the size is, and then pushes that into an existing DynamoDB table. It's important that that table exists so it can be pushed into it. It won't create that for you. And again, you can scale that up to, to push that in faster. Any questions on any of that? So are those file names unique, or do you choose the file name? As part of the S3 object, you can define just the location, and it, it will automatically create that file structure for you. So 
So how do you maintain that? Do you just keep adding files to some issues? It's it's got a date appended to the name, so yeah. make sure that it's in every time. Yeah, but how do I get rid of the old ones? Yeah. Within S3, <laughs> you can clean that up yourself. Yeah, yeah. So it will remain. Yeah. So it doesn't. There's no way of maintaining. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, the life cycle of them had to close through if you wanted to maintain backups on the daily schedule. Um, some blog posts there, I think the slides are sent out as part of the sign in. So, a bit of blog posts on how to auto scale DynamoDB, part of the DynamoDB accelerator and the export and import process. Cool. That's it. Cool. Any Thank you. Any other questions? Is that going to be captured in Cloud Drive? It is as well, yes. All yeah. our logs and data DBs are captured in Cloud Drive. How many years are you doing? Why are you doing EMR? So, the EMR is used, if, for those that don't know Elastic Map Reduce, it, it effectively spins up EC2 instances with a Hadoop framework on that, and that will actually go and pull the data from Dynamo. So, it's pretty much the, the process which collects the data and then pushes that off into S3. How many is it doing? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions on that? Thank you. Up <laughs> oh, now we have. Up <laughs> oh, now we have Nicholas from uh, Cloud Health. Do you know where the are? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> See, we did not do that. Very first words. Yeah. Positive. Good evening, everybody. My name is Nick Noni, and I'm a senior cloud data specialist for Cloud Health Technologies. I've been with the organization now for a little over a year and a half, and in that time, I've had the opportunity to develop markets for Cloud Health across three different continents. This has given me a unique insight into how organizations all over the world are dealing with the complexities of leveraging cloud at scale. Where EC2 tends to predominantly drive the majority of the cost with cloud spend, it's one of those areas that organizations are constantly looking at to further optimize. So tonight I want to share with you some of the best practices that I've compiled, working with a variety of organizations from all over the world. Anyone here have challenges on their cloud spend? No, no, yes, one, we only got one, two, yeah, three, okay. cool. So I don't know how familiar you all are with cloud health, but we're the industry leading cloud service management platform for organizations leveraging cloud at scale. We provide granular insight and automation around the cost, usage, performance, and security of a cloud environment. When I joined Cloud Health in January 2016, we just received our B round of funding and I was employee number seven. Since then, a lot has changed. We have over 180 employees dispersed throughout the globe. Um, and with that, 600 direct customers and more than 1,300 channel customers through a network of over 80 wonderful partners, two of whom are here tonight, both Boulder 7 and most recently Westcom. So with that growth has come further funding, and we actually just closed our D round of funding last week, raising the total capital to $86 million. This round was led by Kleiner Perkins, I'm really excited about that because I don't know how many of you are familiar with Kleiner Perkins, but they were the backer of companies like Amazon, Google, Spotify, and Uber. So we're really excited to continue expanding and to continue helping organizations to eliminate the complexities around the cloud, like strategies around optimizing EC2. So as you all know, AWS is a myriad of instance types, and they all have their own benefit. So you have your general purpose instances. These are gonna give you an even distribution of CPU to memory, and they're extremely cost effective, which makes them one of the most popular instance types Amazon offers. That's gonna be your T and your M family. For CPU intensive workloads like front end fleets or web servers or distributed analytics, that's when you're going to use your compute optimized instances, which are the C fan. For DB clusters and other memory intensive applications, that's when you're going to want to use memory optimized instance, and that's your X family and your R family. Now, one of the newer instance types that Amazon offers for cutting edge CPU, like extremely CPU intensive workloads, like your 3D gaming or streaming or genome sequencing, those are your accelerated compute instances. That's your P, your G, and your F families. Lastly, you have your storage optimized instances. And with this, you have two options. You have your I family, which are high IO instances. They're good for distributed analytics or NoSQL databases. And you have your 
D instances, which are good for MPP data warehousing or logging data processing applications. That's the D. So each of these instances have a significantly different cost profile than one another. So it's really important to make sure that we match the instance that we're going to be running our workload on with the appropriate application. So this is one of the most common issues that organizations run into, and it occurs even with the most sophisticated cloud users. They're using instances that are a lot too large for the application they have running on them. Um, and you see this especially following a lift and shift. The reason for that is when organizations migrate to the cloud, they'll bring a lot of the headroom they have left on that server with them, but that's just not how cloud's supposed to be used. So to properly right size the instances, you know, why is this so prevalent? The majority of the time, it's because it takes a lot to compile and analyze these uh, applications. And where cloud is so dynamic, by the time you've actually run that analysis, it's out of date. Uh, the other reason is that organizations don't want to allocate a single person to do this just because of the time it takes. It takes them away from projects that can provide value back to the business. So this is ex especially prevalent across large organizations. The reason for that being that I've worked with accounts that have a thousand accounts and tens of thousands of instances. So it's a fairly daunting task. And a lot of the time when you work with them, the first question they'll have is, you know, where would I even start? So this is one of the many complexities that Cloud Health helps you to eliminate. And to properly right size your instances, you need a broad set of metrics. This is just so you can understand your workloads required. So to start, we're going to pull some of these metrics from CloudWatch. That's where we're going to get our CPU, our disk I.O., and our network I.O. These are very essential <coughs> metrics, but they're still leaving out a fair amount. So how are we going to go about filling that gap? At CloudHealth, we partner with the most popular and industry-leading technology vendors. And it's through two of these partners that we're going to pull the memory, the disk utilization, and the file system utilization, and that's through Datadog and New Relic. Now, we do also have a agent as well as a custom metrics API, simply in case you're not using these tools. So once we start pulling those metrics, we can give each instance a total score, and that total score is based off the CPU, the memory, the disk, the network in, and the network out. So now that we're starting to pull these metrics, we can begin to properly right size the instances, Yet, one of the most essential pieces of information that we're currently missing is your knowledge. So at CloudHealth, you can drill into all of these metrics, and we tie the breadth and the depth of the platform into every report. The reason for this is now we can hover over our memory, and we can get all the information associated with it. You're never more than three clicks away from the metadata for each instance. So here we can see the average CPU, the type, the virtual core, the memory, even the tags. The reason we do this is so that you can, so you can tie your contextual knowledge around the business and the applications to understand whether or not the recommendation we're making in the cloud platform is something that you want to take action on. So this is an example of that recommendation. We see here that this instance is severely underutilized and that the projected cost for the month is $510. By simply downgrading to an R3 large, we'd save $364 a month without affecting the workload running on it. So this is something you can actually take action on directly from the Cloud Health platform. You can delete, start, stop, or even reboot the instance. But one of the things that's really interesting is, is we allow you to tie a Lambda function to this. And this allows a lot more customized actions. An example of this that I saw a customer using uh, a week ago would be writing a Lambda function that would take a snapshot of the server and it would reinstate that workload onto the new recommended server type. This just allows you to make sure that you're continuously optimizing your own command EC2. Um, so to further optimize the environment, we're gonna take a look at reservations. So reservations are one of the most effective ways to drive down the cost of your EC2, but they're a fairly complex topic even for the most battle-hardened veteran of AWS. So before we're going to take a look at actually modeling out the RI purchase, there's three things we need to understand, and that's the purchasing, also known as the types. So you have your all up fronts. These are going to give you the most benefit every time, and they're really good for organizations that say they have a budget 
that they need to consume by the end of financial year. It's just as easy as going in and buying those RIs because since they are all up front, you never need to make another pick. Partial upfronts give you a similar discount structure to an all upfront, but with less capital upfront. And this is why they're one of the most popular RI types. You see. Lastly, we have our no upfronts, but these are gonna have less of a discount, but they're really good for organizations with budget constraints. When I was working with agile startups in New York City, a lot of them would use no upfront because they had issues around liquidity, but they didn't want to slow their pace of innovation. That's a really good time to use no upfronts. So some RIs do come with capacity assurance, but most of the time this isn't why I see organizations using RIs. If you need the capacity assurance, it's usually for disaster recovery or critical business applications. But again, the majority of the time, I see organizations using them for the cost savings. So now that we understand this, What's the first thing we need to take into consideration for purchasing an RI? Uh, first and foremost, we need to understand the business conditions. What are these? Well, primarily it's gonna be the, biz the budget the business is willing to allocate for the purchase and what payback period the business wants to see. That's why we're gonna start with the term and the type. So two things to consider with the term is that a one-year RI almost always breaks even at six months. What I mean by this is that at 100% usage, after six months, you can terminate that instance and you'll still benefit from the discount structure. For a three-year RI, that break-even point is usually around nine months. Now, obviously this doesn't work for no upfronts, simply because the moment you start using a no upfront, it's instantly cheaper than an on-demand. So this is why we're gonna start with the uh, financial considerations, because at the end of the day, using an RI is a financial decision. To the end user, it really doesn't matter whether they're using a reserved instance or an on-demand instance, they can work the same. So it's, it's really a financial consideration. So now that we've taken the term and the type into consideration, what else do we need to think about before we can actually purchase the RI? Uh, this is when we're gonna take all the other business considerations around the RI purchase into effect. This is gonna be everything from the platform to the instance type to the tenancy. So this is one of the complexities that Cloud Health helps eliminate, and we eliminate the pivot tables, the Excel spreadsheets, and the general uncertainty around RIs through our RI optimizer. So all you do is you put in everything that we've considered before this, and Cloud Health will make a recommendation based off your projected and your historic usage. This further illustrates why it's really important to right size before we look at buying an RI. So one of the other things that Cloud Health can do is, is base this analysis off a certain group's usage. Uh, one of, it can be a team, it can be a business unit. But one of the examples I recently saw was an organization that had a production application environment. And this was driving really high on-demand costs. So for them, it was just as simple as going in and modeling a purchase off that unit's specific usage, and from there, reserving instances. So now we've taken this into consideration. What's the next step? So, Cloud Health will give you multiple recommendations built off multiple scenarios. And this is just so you can get the most benefit for your RI purchase. As we see on the right, what the gray is illustrating is the actual number of instances used. Whereas the red and the blue are showing how with a combination of partial upfronts and no upfronts, we can best reserve the environment. And again, this is based off your usage. We'll also give you the financial information around the purchase. That's gonna be the payback period, the ROI, and the total savings. The reason for this is it helps explain the benefit of an RI to your non-technical counterpart. And it really helps bridge the gap between tech and finance. So once we've taken a look at this purchase and, and we feel comfortable and we want to move ahead, it's just as simple as purchasing it directly through the Cloud Health platform. So we've now modeled out this purchase and one of the bad habits that you see people have is given the long term of RIs, it lulls them into this false sense of security that I don't need to look at the RI until it's about to expire. But that's a bad habit and that's a habit we really need to break. By continuously monitoring your RIs, you can actually extend their benefit. So first and foremost, you need to keep an eye on underutilized reservations. The reason for this is when we did that break even analysis, we did it at 100% usage. So if that RI is underutilized, that's gonna affect the benefit that we would see from we also need to look for areas of high on-demand usage. This is that example of the production application environment. It's just as simple as realizing that it's driving a lot of on-demand usage, 
going in and modeling out a purchase form. Lastly, we need to stay on top of expiring reservations. I, I know this sounds super simple, but it's actually an area that a lot of organizations can work on because the moment that RI expires and we're using an on-demand instance in its stead, it's immediately gonna start negating the benefit of that previous RI. So we know what we can do for high on-demand usage, but what can we do about those underutilized reservations? Because like we said, that's gonna affect everything we have. So RIs can actually be modified in a limited amount of ways. The way you can do this is through modifying it between uh, availability zone and regional scope, or modifying between availability zones within the same region for the zone that that RI is uh, on. You can also modify between classic EC2 and your VPC. And, and lastly, you can also change the size of the instance within the same family. This is very similar to what we did in that right size. So the reason that you need to maximize your ROI is because if you have an <coughs> underutilized reservation, or even worse, if it's idle, you're gonna lose those cost savings. And, and you should never be using an on-demand instance if you have an underutilized or an idle reservation. So how can we make sure that we're always utilizing that reservation? It's when a split or merger or move is available, you really have two options. The first is that we can notify you and you can go in and you can investigate further. The other option is that we can actually automatically modify that on your behalf, as long as it's within the parameters that you yourself have set. So by continuously modifying our eyes, we're able to make sure that we see the cost benefit that we all thought we would get when we moved to the cloud. Because the reality of the situation is, according to Gardner, it's not uncommon for cloud goes to be two to three times higher than expected. So what is it I want you to take away from this presentation? It's that first and foremost, you need to right size before you buy your RIs. On top of that, you need to understand the features and the types of RIs so you can make the most informed buying decision for your organization. You need to continuously and automatically modify reservations so you're always getting the maximum value from your investment. And lastly, you can get alerts and underutilized reservations uh, and opportunities so that your environment is in a constant stage of optimization because just given the dynamic nature of cloud, we need to constantly make sure we're optimizing because if we do it once, a month later, two months later, even three months later, it's not going to be right size. So, thank you very much. Are there uh, any questions? Yeah, Kyle, you have a question. How much do we pay for And is there a free trial? So, yes, there is a free trial. As for what the actual subscription model is, I'm not on that side of the business. But actually, if you talk to my colleague Elise over there, she would be able to break that down. Can we just through your reservation That's correct. So locking you in for that three-year rate, you're going to see that benefit after nine months. So everything from nine months, and, and again, this is usually you see that benefit. Most times you see it after nine months. But so then everything you use from nine months on is all free. Okay. Um, you talk about so if you're using the platform, based off our automated actions, there's really no reason why it shouldn't be even an hourly. Um, but it also really depends on the size of the environment. So a smaller environment, just that scale and that change isn't really gonna happen as frequently or as drastically. It's really when you get to that larger size of environment that it's going to be constantly changing and, and constantly uh, scaling. But doesn't this depend on your environment? You can't just be killing off instances if it's not stateless. I mean, you can't just say, oh, I'm gonna switch up the server because we're gonna turn it into some other type of instance on the fly without a business impact unless it's in some order scaling group and it's all automated. Well, so that depends, right? So it depends on the actual situation. Um, some environments where by right uh, downgrading to a smaller instance type, you're really not affecting that workload. It's think about it as if it was a data center and you're leaving that extra headroom on the instance. There's really no need for it. You still have to turn it into an Amy and then redeploy it so it doesn't out. But by tying a Lambda function to it, it doesn't need to be an outage. 
you can do it at a lot more rapid of a pace. And, and it's also something that, you know, save the downtime of the environment. It's as simple as right, as right side of the internet. It's a matter of time. It depends. <laughs> it, it depends on how it happens. If I've got a, if I've got an instance that needs to have a new, different type of instance, yeah, you can take a snapshot, bring up the new one, take a snapshot, bring up the new one, and then repoint your DNS and then turn off the old one if you wanted. And you can do that with Lambda if you want. Just take snapshots, deploy, update DNS. There's engineering involved, but it's, yeah. it depends. Yeah, it depends on how you deploy your environment. And Pretty your much setup. has to be stateless, otherwise it won't work. I guess. Yeah. How, how do we pay for you guys? Is there, is there, uh, yeah, so if there's any questions, feel free to talk to myself, uh, my colleague Elise as well, or some of our wonderful partners who are here tonight, like Fuller 7 and West Coast. <laughs> um, when you do your cost analysis, do you consider other regions? So moving to a different region will actually save you some money? Uh, so that is something that we'll take into account. We'll look at you know whatever is the best cost option for your business and, and without disrupting what you're actually doing. Okay, and do you also consider spots as an option? Yes and no. So that's not something directly in the platform. Like we can report on spot. Yeah. Um, but could you recommend use the bots because they're they're at this discount right now for first few workloads? It's a pretty good question. Um, Elise, any? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, not currently, but it is absolutely something that we have built requirements out for and will be coming into the platform shortly. Okay, and then I'm guessing in terms of that, you'll, you could start trending towards uh, requesting CPUs rather than instances via spots. It's certainly something that we're looking at for that new module. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so so really we just looked at right sizing and RIs, but we do do everything across cost, storage, trend in. I mean specifically like if you have a patch which is resizing instance, you then, are you then able to track against the cost of that instance from like, for example, the build file and say, okay, I, that instance, or oh, sorry, that thing had a save this much because it's gone down, like is that something that you can automatically or take those maps? Um, that's something that very soon the platform will be able to. Um, it will be able to show you the same, you know, no. what that actually did for you. Uh, and my second one is just does it support uh, size, but support instances, and now the new convertible RIs? It does. We support every service that AWS offers. We're actually a majority engineer company, so the pace of innovation is very quick. Do you look at your site where the um, instances, instances are getting hard? Ninety-five percent plus. You know, some of the key, some of the KPIs are uh, up towards the red. Is that something you can get um, notified on as well? Um, yes, yes. Do you mean like memory and CPU, or what? What do you mean KPIs? Rather than underutilized. Rather than under, rather than underutilized, where parts of your um, you know your landscape are um, a overutilized. Um, so not currently, but that is something that, again, is coming out later this quarter, I believe. Because um, right now we make recommendations on downsizing, not on It's more the upsizing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Does it support multiple accounts? How do we plug in multiple accounts? Yeah, so that's something that we can configure from the master consolidated, um, and then we'll get all the linked accounts underneath. But if you were talking about for seeing a specific linked account, you could also do it at that point. You could configure it. So, any other questions? I know I'm standing between you guys for pizza. And <laughs> <laughs> so, don't want to keep you. And it smells good. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, excellent. Now that I think about it, I think I've got. One I, think more you, slide. I think you have one more slide left here. Yeah. Here we go. Please. So. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>